just reading off what I'm getting here. Um, to the, um, maybe that. Are we driven by technology according to which what can be done? I'll, ha I'll have a go. At that. You have a go. go. Please, yeah, Patricia. I'll have a go at that because I think what there is, it's, I wouldn't call it an autonomous weapons market. Not yet. I'd call it a, an enterprise which is global um, and uh, where um, innovation is occurring that introduces um, machine learning and the progress towards whatever we start to call in artificial intelligence into weapon systems, just as we integrated cyber technologies into weapon systems. I just want to talk a little bit about our global enterprise because what we mustn't forget is that innovation is a, a human attribute, right? It's all humans innovate. It doesn't belong. Technologies get developed throughout the world. They get hacked. Look at what the Ukrainians have been doing with like quite basic weapon systems, right? It's quite brilliantly. This is all over the world. It doesn't belong to a group. It, and to imagine that it would, it's a, it's a bit like export controls and so on. They only, they'll delay a little bit, but they often lead to a false sense of security in which you imagine you're the ones with it and others don't have it. And that's always a mistake. Thank you. Thompson, please. Uh, thank you. Just uh, perhaps to reiterate, I think that that was part of also my, my initial presentation when I say that uh, the, the problem of this, which we sometimes we refer to as the business of death, is that there are those who make profits from it and that those who do the dying. Mm. The unfortunate thing is that if you look at where that market or the economies that improve with the production of those, uh, particularly it's in the global north, whilst the global south are on the receiving end. And on that point, I always emphasize to say, if roles were reversed, would, be, would we be today even talking of uh, the arms trade as a legitimate trade? I think that's where the problem starts. The legitimization of arms trade, as if it's a legitimate trade, it's business. It's not. If we say that drugs are bad because they kill people and they're banned, why is the arms trade, which is core in many big nations' uh, industries, why is that acceptable to humanity? Power. Who decides what humanity accepts and what is not acceptable? For me, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So Maybe an almost philosophical question to uh, pose to you to the end that goes as follows. Are we being driven by technology according to which what can be done has become what should be done? Well, why don't I start with answering that yes, because please. I'm rather the skunk Thank at the you. party uh, on the on the panel in terms of the prospects for treaties and arms racing and so on. And so I want to finish on an optimistic note, which is to say that we have human agency uh, and it's humans that decide for good or ill on these things. And of course, in the Whitman quote, I'm large, I contain multitudes. We have both good and ill. Uh, I, th I think I always uh, r remind, remind myself to steer clear of technologically determinist arguments where there's no human choice left, and the outcome is inevitable. The issue is far too uncertain and complex for that to be the case. Uh, and so, yes, there is the prospect for a good outcome. Thank you. Patricia, please. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I originally trained as a physicist in nuclear physics. So um, what I see in our relationship with technology is that we do decide what technology we want to keep and what we don't. Um, and I think we've seen many uh, weapon systems, for example, that we've just discarded because they're no longer so very useful, or maybe they were too difficult, or maybe, if you take the case of biological weapons, why did we choose nuclear weapons in our international system for some countries to have them, and not biological weapons? I mean, I, I, can, I can explain why, but you, know, you can reverse all of those arguments. So let's, let's be clear, we, we are, we decide what we do. And if some people misbehave, and there will always be people who misbehave, they are in a minority, this is where we go to law. We've got to enforce the law. When people misbehave, when countries behave, when they break the law, 
there have to be consequences. They may not be immediate consequences, but there have to be consequences. Thanks. I, th I think human agency and the law is a good place to stop. Um, I wanted to hand over to Christian, um, asking you if you have any closing observation, uh, because we have to wrap it up. Uh, please, Christian. Thank you, Alex. Uh, four points. First of all, this is a broader discussion. It's not a disarmament discussion. It's not a human international humanitarian law discussion. It's a human rights uh, uh, discussion, which is mean and goes also in innovation and technologies, which is mean this is fundamental. This is a conclusion that I have. Second, we need urgent negotiations. This is a sense of urgency, and we need to, to, to move forward to, to take action. And, uh, and four, I think that we need to start these negotiations also with all the stakeholders in having data, data that can prove also what we, we are saying. And finally, Alex, I think that uh, since February last year, we started in Belen, we had the spirit of Belen, we went to uh, Freetown, we have the spirit of Freetown, and now we have the spirit of Vienna. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. a, a couple of points I wanted to make from, from my side, because we talked a lot about uh, the Oppenheimer moment was sort of floating around uh, a lot. I, it was, someone said yesterday, Trinity, is it Hiroshima? I wanted to refer back to the Oppenheimer moment, but in a different way, it's in a way a little bit later, when we had uh, scientists who were involved uh, issuing warnings, Oppenheimer himself, uh, Einstein, uh, Russell Manifesto, and so on, um, which then got, of course, um, dominated by the Cold War, by geopolitics. And I think the parallel that we can draw is maybe that, that we have a major technological breakthrough with artificial intelligence and everything that it brings, similar like uh, uh, nuclear fission brought a lot of things, but it also brought the um, uh, nuclear weapon. We, we have this moment where we have expert scientists warning, uh, and these warnings are at risk of being, uh, of falling by the wayside because of the geopolitical tensions, and I think that's the connection I see to the Oppenheimer moment. Uh, so, which of course calls for l l agency, law, leadership, I think, foresight. These are the, these are the issues that, uh, that uh, um, and decisions being taken and some decisions not being taken. I think that's, that's also important. Um, on, on the excellent panel, I really wanted, wanted to thank you, covering a whole broad range of issues from the civilian dimensions. I think a lot to think about in the future, what could be the implications. And then, of course, there's much that we don't know yet. There's much speculation. There's probably something a little bit too much determinist uh, talk sometimes. But then the risks are there, and we have to talk about that. We have to try to address them, the issues of dehumanization, the potential of arms racing, of uh, uh, lowering, lowering the threshold for conflict, uh, uh, and all of those aspects. So these are, I think, really, really important uh, uh, takeaways. I wanted to um, uh, thank the panel, and I wanted to ask all of you to please join me in thanking our excellent speakers, and thanks to my co-moderator uh, Christian. I have a couple of anno announcements I need to make. Uh, the first is uh, side events. We have two side events, one organized by the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs and the International Committee of the Red Cross which is called Legal Reviews of New Weapons, Addressing the Challenges Posed by New and Emerging Technologies. Um, and the second uh, side event will, uh, is by the Arms Control Association. Um, sorry, the first side event will take place from 1.15 uh, to 2.30. And I don't have in my notes where it is, but you find it uh, uh, outside. 
and the second one is from the Arms Control Association, which will take place from 1.30 to 2.30. And it's the Arms Control Association together with the European Leadership Network and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And it's about AI, automated battlefield management systems, and the risks of unintended nuclear escalation. Again, you find the information in your folder. And now to the speakers uh, and to the afternoon session. Uh, you may have seen the speakers list, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is there. We have, in a way, a luxury pro uh, problem that we have almost 60 delegations that have requested to take the floor, which, of course, is really excellent, and we thank all of you for your interest. But from an organizational point of view, it poses some challenges that we are really hard-pressed to make sure that everybody who wants to speak can speak. So we changed the afternoon program slightly, that we will not have two sessions, but one session which essentially starts sharp at 2.30 and which will go till closely before 6 o'clock uh, when we have to, um, uh, uh, we have to essentially uh, stop here at 6 o'clock. So a few minutes before 6, we will have the closing, but we have one session uh, that runs from 2.30 till close to 6 o'clock. And I really want to um, uh, reiterate the plea to all delegations to make statements not exceeding three minutes. Uh, otherwise, we will not get through, and we really want to give everybody the opportunity to speak. Longer versions of the statement can be uh, posted on the website. We will, as chair, um, maybe appear rude when we cut people off after three minutes. So I apologize to that already, but that's the only way that we can uh, make sure that everybody can speak. So with that, I thank you once again uh, for your interest and uh, engagement. Thank the panel again and, and enjoy lunch and the side events. Thank you very much.